in a nutshell, in 2012, um, I cycled from London to Hong Kong uh, by myself. Uh, I met some very interesting people along the way, who some of whom you're going to meet in a minute. Um, and I did it in, uh, in aid of breast cancer care. Uh, it was just over 16,500 kilometers through 21 countries. Now, I've done a few talks, as, uh, as you may have guessed. I've done it to corporate companies, I've done it to schools, I've done it to kids age five, kids, kid, kids age 21. Um, and I've adapted my talk over, over the years. As opposed to doing a chronological kind of talk of what I did and what I cycled and how far I went, that would be difficult to do because otherwise you're going to be here for 180 days and that would be boring for you and boring for me. So the way I attack it is kind of trying to answer as many questions as possible during the talk and in the hope of at the end there are no questions at all. <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. 14th of April 2012, I left from Buckingham Palace, looking like that. Uh, all of the kit was brand new. Uh, the bike and the bags together weighed approximately 46 kilograms. My body weighed 105 kilograms. Um, it's probably what I weigh now. Uh, 180 days later, through 21 countries, I won't name them all, but you can see them here. I ended up in Hong Kong on the 11th of October 2012, weighing 76 kilograms. <laughs> my bike weighed the same, and my bags dropped about 15 kilograms. So I dropped a lot of the kit because I bought lots of shit. I didn't need half of it. Uh, some of the stuff I bought was I bought two bowls, two knives, two forks, two cups. And I kind of thought to myself, am I planning on entertaining on this trip? Am I, am I even having guests when I pitch my tent in the middle of nowhere? So after two weeks, I obviously got rid of half of my stuff, realizing I didn't need it. Um, so as I said, I'm going to talk about it in topics. And of course, the, the topic for today is broken. And what I'm going to kind of discuss is how my mind and my body was broken throughout this trip and potentially pieced together throughout. But um, I'll let you be the judge of that. Uh, so the first topic is sleeping. Everyone always asks, you're 180 days on the road, 180, 180 days exactly. I didn't plan it to be that way. And I actually ended up 11th of October was my dad's birthday, so it all kind of happened quite, quite, uh, quite nicely. Uh, sleeping, people ask, how did you sleep? Uh, I had a tent, a one-man tent, which I didn't have before. Um, and probably under 180 days, I haven't done the statistics, but I would imagine 140 of those nights I slept in this tent. Uh, the other 40 nights were a mix of bed and breakfast, guest houses, and people inviting me into their homes, which happened more often than, than you would think. Not so much in Europe, because people in Europe are a little bit more standoffish. Uh, pretty much as soon as you cross the, the Asian border in Istanbul, people started to invite you into their homes, and it was incredibly, incredibly genuine. I spent 25 days in Iran, 13 of those nights, people inviting me into their home. So people asked me how you slept, and this was kind of one I did a campsite, and of course, when people look at these photos, they go, wow, I wish I was doing this. And of course, some of the campsites I was staying in were fantastic. Um, these are just few examples. Um, I, had a, kind of, I, I, I had a pretty good camera, and I practiced the art of selfies a lot. And, um, and as you can see here in this photo, this was near the beginning of the trip, I'd never put up a tent before. I'm not really an outdoors person, I am now. And I'm not really a cyclist, I kind of am now. Um, as you can see, that is not really a tall tent. And it rained that night, and I got drenched, because I didn't know how to put my tent up properly. Um, so of course, some people go, wow, this must have been a fantastic trip. Look at all the places you slept. Uh, and sometimes you slept without a tent. But then, of course, these are the pictures that people don't like to see, because it's not quite as idyllic and it's not quite as perfect as these you know, beautiful sunset photos. Wow, your life must have been great. No, sometimes you were sleeping under a highway in China. Um, literally, that was a three-lane highway above us. It was in the middle of the desert. There was nowhere else to camp. So we slept under there. And just before I took this photo, there was a, a man who was driving along, pulled up, ran underneath the road, and went to the toilet underneath tunnel on the opposite side, which I laughed at. I was like, that's funny. Ha ha. 
And then I thought, someone's probably been to the toilet where I'm sleeping right now. <laughs> so, uh, and lo and behold, I was really ill two days later. Um, I'll talk about this guy in a minute, Zach. So I did do it solo, but as, you, as you'll see later, I met a few people on the road. Second thing is people ask, how do you eat? Kind of pretty basic. But of course, if you're cycling, I was cycling around, on average, 160, 70 kilometers per day. Um, the, the, the most I cycled in a day was 307 kilometers. So I wanted to kind of push myself, and that was the, the definition of broken at the end of that. I've got a photo of what I looked like at the end of that. On average, 160 kilometers, so I had to eat a lot. And I, I enjoy eating, I'm sure everyone here enjoys eating. But being able to eat as much as you want without gaining any weight whatsoever mm. was fantastic. <laughs> Get my hands on anything. Much like with the tent, this was my first night camping just outside of Dover in England. Uh, I'd never used a stove before, I'd never used a camping stove before. And these are two friends who joined me from London to Amsterdam. And I didn't have any fuel for my stove because I was vastly unprepared for this trip. Fortunately, they were here to, otherwise I'd have been eating dry pasta and tomato ketchup on my first night. Luckily, my friends were here. As you can see, they're, they're seasoned travellers, seasoned campers, and they were, they were a godsend. Um, just a little bit on my unpreparedness. It was a very spontaneous thing. I decided three months before leaving, I'll get to that a little bit later, so my whole planning element was minimal. I didn't have any visas before leaving, I had no maps. Um, which people were kind of shocked at, but although it sounds naive, when I left, you kind of think, all you've got to do is cycle east. If I'm ever cycling west, I'm going the wrong way. And it sounds really stupid, but it kind of worked. <laughs> that in Europe, it was slightly more difficult because there are lots of roads, but again, like I use Istanbul as the market. As soon as you cross Istanbul, there are a lot of far fewer roads, far fewer trade routes, and you're following the old Silk Road along from Istanbul through to Kashgar, following on to Hong Kong. Um, so I didn't you know, kind of, literally, if I was cycling west, I was going the wrong way. And I did sometimes. Um, so back to food, every night I'd pitch my tent, light my stove. Uh, as you, again, you can see my tent was incredibly untoward. Um, and much of the food, is from China, people would stop and be interested in what you're doing. Um, and they'd say, you must stop and have a barbecue with us on the side of the road. <laughs> of course, I will. Uh, again, it's in Iran you'd stop and they would invite you into their home and they were the most generous and kind people I'd ever met. Um, they would, without, you know, I, I kicked a granny out of her bed. I, I didn't physically, but the family insisted that I must sleep in the bed. And I said, no, I can't. This belongs to your granny who's 82 years old. I must sleep on the floor. I admit I ended up sleeping in the bed and she slept on the floor because <laughs> there was nothing I could say <laughs> that would allow her to sleep in the bed. And that was the kind of extreme lengths and afterwards you just kind of have to relax and kind of go with the flow. Um, other question, people washed 180 days. How did you wash? What was your hygiene like? Um, it was terrible. <laughs> um, I, I'm normally quite a clean person. I'm clean shaved today. I've combed my hair. Um, but normally, on this trip, this kind of scene was my shower. Uh, apart from the few days when I was staying at people's houses, staying in a bed and breakfast, staying in a guest house where I'd have a warm shower, maybe you know, 20, 30 days out of 180 days, this would be normally, you know, you, you wash the, re <laughs> the areas that you need washing. And if anyone cycles here, sweat builds up, salt builds up, and uh, it gets quite uncomfortable. So just a few images of me looking filthy at the end of the day. This is actually a hotel in China that I stay at. It may look really smart, but it cost five pounds for the night. And the bellboy, who had no idea what was going on, was very kind and gave me slippers, which <laughs> was the first thing that sprung to his mind. Like, you must have slippers. <laughs> um, this was halfway through the 360 kilometer day, whilst I was still smiling, with a terrible moustache and kind of dirt all over my face. Uh, lakes, rivers, uh, not so much seas, uh, because of obviously like you're trying to wash the salt off and if you try and wash in the ocean you're going to add more salt so the fresher the water the better um, and this in China was again just all these irrigation systems with fresh water and I got a little video just to show you of kind of I hope you just bring it to life I don't get fully naked ready to go okay Woo! <laughs> 
water is freezing. <laughs> yeah, we have to watch the whole video. Um, but also, just a little funny thing, like I don't know if any of you travelled to Asia or travelled a lot. Um, you know those little little shampoo packets that have like a tiny amount of shampoo? And I always looked at them before this trip and I thought, who buys these? <laughs> this is completely pointless. I buy them. <laughs> they had so much point, and that's all I used to kind of wash my stuff with. I had a bath soap, but as soon as I could get my hand on one of those shampoos and wash my hair, it was brilliant. Um, and also, you, know, you see my hair growing. My, my mother, who I did, uh, I'll talk about later again, uh, the reason I did it was, or part of the reason I did it was for breast cancer care. Um, she's absolutely fine now, but she was going through chemotherapy at the time, and she shaved her head, and I shaved my head at the same time in kind of uh, solidarity. And uh, it was actually the best decision I ever made because I'd never had cut my hair that short before and it cut down the washing and hygiene uh, a lot. Um, this, this is obviously a beautiful image. This was in uh, Kyrgyzstan just before coming into China. But this was just to show you that uh, people ask, especially the kindergarten, the first question was, where did you go to the toilet? <laughs> uh, this was my toilet. <laughs> I took this photo whilst I was on the toilet. <laughs> and that was my toilet. <laughs> again, very basic, but people ask those questions. Uh, again, broken, mechanics and health. Um, this was a common scene on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, this was fixing a, fixing a puncture. Again, before this trip, I was not a cyclist before leaving for this trip. Um, I cycled to work. I did a few odd, few odd trips. My mechanical skills were poor, but you learn, it's like anything. You, you learn on the job, the first puncture took an hour to fix. By China, I was fixing them in about five minutes. Um, but this was a daily occurrence. It happened a lot and it was very frustrating. Um, so again, this is a common scene. This was my sleeping mat that uh, come China had developed a tumor, as you can see in the middle. Um, it started popping all over and that was the most uncomfortable thing to sleep on for the next four weeks. Um, again, people always think, that's a beautiful image. And I was talking about, uh, this was a lake in Turkey called Tuzguru, uh, salt lake. So I took this beautiful photo, and then for the next week, I had salt all over my bike. That ruined my bike, ruined the chain, ruined the brakes, ruined the gears. Um, so it's a beautiful photo, people love it. Uh, I've got a mouse pad of this photo but it's actually probably one of the worst memories of my trip. Um, just a few facts, 92 punctures, three new tires, uh, not as many people think, two chains. Uh, when a chain breaks, uh, does anyone know how to fix a chain when it breaks? Yeah, I, I didn't. <laughs> I was in the middle of nowhere, and um, I swore a lot. Uh, sleeping mat punctures, nine. Liters of tears due to mechanical problems, 13.2. I cried a lot. I'm not a crier, but uh, on this trip, I, somehow my tear ducts kind of came to life. Um, expletives used while fixing, kind of missed there, probably about 10,000. Um, with the health, uh, of course, I, I, I got ill a lot. Uh, I, had a, I had paracetamol, I had kind of basic medicine. My, my thing was, if I got ill, I would just stay in my campsite for two or three days until I got better essentially, um, which, considering I come from a family of doctors and my girlfriend's a doctor, they would probably advise to do something else, but once you're in the middle of nowhere, all you can do is kind of sit there, relax, and uh, hope you get better soon. <laughs> um, this was at the end of the 306 kilometer day. Um, yeah, I look pretty terrible. Broken. Dogs. Um, cute, I, I don't know, are people here dog people or cat people? I love dogs, personally, but uh, around Turkey and Turkey and Greece, they're a complete pain in the ass because there's something about as you're cycling along. Um, I don't know what it is, maybe the calf, as you're cycling, looks like a spit, like a beautiful piece of meat, and the dog's like, mm, mm, I want, mm, I want, and they start chasing you and they start barking. And these aren't little dogs, these are Rottweilers, these are 
these uh, um, uh, what were they called in Turkey? Um, these giant bears, essentially chasing you. Um, so I asked my mum when they, she came out to Istanbul, it's like I need something to fight the dogs off, and she came out with a horse whip, which was inventive of her. Uh, it wasn't very useful because I didn't want to strike a dog. I'm not. I'm not into that. Um, but I, I did use it. So my method was: as soon as the dog came, I'd get off my bike and I'd make lots of noise and try and scare it off. Um, and then the dog made more noise. <laughs> it didn't really work. It's kind of. It, it was a big problem, and uh, you'll see from a few pictures. And this was um, kind of to do with health. You know, people think you must be so tanned. You must, you know, pick up a lot of girls on this kind of trip. You're not going to pick up a lot of girls looking like that. Uh, so for six months, I looked like that. Unfortunately, you can't smell a photo. I smelled pretty bad. Uh, I was sleeping in a one-man tent. It wasn't conducive to picking up ladies and bringing them back to your one-man tent. <laughs> that didn't work. Mental health and loneliness. Um, of course, again, with photos like this, everyone goes, wow, that must be amazing. But of course, you look behind the scenes, as I'm sure most photographers here, that took a while to set up. It was quite sad. I was trying to look pensive and look serious. But it came out quite well. <laughs> but this was a standard lunch, kind of in the middle of nowhere. You know, of course, I'm not normally taking photos of myself, but I want to take a few photos. And people always ask, did you go crazy? Did you start talking to yourself? Uh, yes, I did. Um, I had a video camera and I started videoing myself every day. So I've got lots of videos, yeah, I've, you can check them out on the website and like mesh lots together. Um, and I felt that whenever I had the camera, I felt, it felt normal to talk to the camera and it was a nice thing that I, was, I felt like I had a friend I was talking to my video camera. And I thought, this is quite nice, I'm gonna try it without the video camera because why do I need, I, maybe I can just talk to myself. So I tried that for a few days until I realized that's pure crazy, <laughs> because you're just cycling talking to yourself. So I limited it to uh, only talking to the camera. Um, mental health and loneliness, so a lot of this was, you are spending a lot of time by yourself. Again, in Europe, every 10, 15 kilometers you come across a village. Uh, in China and in kind of Central Asia, around Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, you'd be by yourself. There's not many places in the world you can just rely on the road for an hour and have no problems, nothing coming past. So that was a feature of, of the trip, like beautiful scenery, and I was just by myself. I loved it. Um, and people ask me, like, why did you do it by yourself? I did it by myself because it was very spontaneous last minute, and I thought I could ask people to do it, but then selfishly, maybe you have to like, kind of, you, you've got to travel with someone, you've got to take someone else's thoughts and feelings into consideration, which sounds mean. Um, I, uh, th this was something for me, uh, something, something I wanted to do, and I enjoyed meeting people on the road, and I, you'll see a few people that I met on the road. Um, and they had really good relationships, and I, I, I cycled with them for two or three days, and it was really fun, but then I was very excited to kind of get back to myself. Um, and of course, when you're broken, when your mind's broken, you think you're by yourself. I was, I was talking to someone uh, earlier, that when you leave, you think you're the only person on the road, you're the only person doing something crazy, I'm unique, I'm special. Um, as soon as you hit the road, you realize you're not. Uh, there are, I met hundreds of people traveling around the world, doing various trips on bicycles, on skateboards, walking, uh, cars, motorbikes. And this was the most fantastic person I've met in my life. He was 64 years old, from Amsterdam, and he was going by a horse and carriage from Amsterdam to Jerusalem over the summer. He was doing about 30 kilometers a day. I cycled past him and I thought, I think I'm crazy. You're definitely crazy. <laughs> um, and he was actually why I actually got the whole whip because I asked him how he deals with the dogs in Greece. And he just got out this massive horse whip. and was like, this is what I do. So that's kind of why I got the horse whip. Uh, he was crazy, like in the, in the horse carriage, he had nothing. He had less equipment than I did. He had a bed, single bed, a stove, and that was it. Uh, of course, how the horse got fed was every 10, 15 kilometers, he said people would stop, whether it was military, whether it was people who had horses, he was invited in every night. He rarely slept in the carriage. By the way, one people met, like people who help you when you're 
in complete need of help. This is in the desert in Turkmenistan. I had no food, I was running out of water, and people out of nowhere were selling watermelons, and we sat down for three hours under the tree, not being able to speak with each other. But um, they offered me watermelons, and we just sat there, and it was heartwarming. And this was a constant feature of the trip. I could show you thousands of photos of the people I met. Unfortunately, I can't remember everyone's name. This guy was special in that he drove past me and waved at me. Uh, this was, in, again, uh, no, this was in Uzbekistan. He drove past and waved and smiled. And at this stage, I'd become accustomed to people stopping and saying hi. And I thought, that's mean. Why would you just drive past and <laughs> just smile and drive off? So now he drives to the nearest town. He bought some water. He came back. He gave me the water and 50 US dollars out of nowhere. Um, just, just these random acts of kindness that, again, would only happen purely east of Istanbul. I, I got kicked off people's farms and estates in Germany uh, and in Austria because people were like, why, what are you doing here? Get off my land. Whereas as soon as you cross a certain barrier, they're like, please come into my home. So it's a very different level of hospitality. Uh, and, and something that I, well, obviously doing an MBA at EHL, is uh, I, I love hospitality, I love being hospitable, and it's something that you see change as you cycle through the world and how, and how that changes. Um, yeah, I mean, kind of thousands of people that I met, and lots of people that I'm still in touch with today. The kids in Kyrgyzstan, they kind of break your heart. Um, and, and one thing I noticed, again, just, just very quickly mentioning about the trip, was um, People have this warped sense of, as you're, say for example in Turkey, as you're cycling through Turkey, uh, I was going through central Turkey, and this was the time when, uh, I don't know if you remember, where there was a plane shot down over Syria, this is when things, in 2012, when things started to go wrong, and the plane left from Malatya. And I left Malatya, uh, central Turkey, and, I, and everyone said, where are you going next? And I said, oh, I'm going to the next town, Bingur. And everyone in Russia said, oh, bingo, oh, you're going to die, you're going to die. And I got nervous. I got really nervous. I was like, maybe I shouldn't go. But I thought, you know, I've, everyone I've met so far has been really nice. I got to bingo, nicest city I've ever been to. Everyone was so nice. And I said, and they said, where have you just come from? I said, oh, Malachia. <laughs> oh, that, oh, really bad. <laughs> and, and it kind of made me realize that there's, there's friction within the cities, but as a traveler, you're, you're accepted on a different level because they want to show their hospitality to you. So they may have kind of issues amongst themselves that they want to kind of get across. But as soon as you turn up, like this, this city on the top right, all the, all the people I met said, don't go here, you're going to get robbed, you're going to have everything stolen off you. I spent three days with this family. This was on the Kyrgyzstan-China border. And they, and they, uh, they, they just treated them like their own, which was um, incredible. Um, Again, in Iran. Uh, has anyone here been to Iran before? Yeah. So, so I, I'm sure lots of things I'm about to say is, is, is kind of rings true with you. Uh, this was my first night in Iran. Um, I was staying with a kind of a couch surfing host, and as I came in, they said we're having a party tonight. And I kind of thought Iran's a dry country. Probably you know, some tea, have some cake. Um, came in. All the Persian rugs were out in the middle of the room. I have never had more alcohol in my life than I had at this party. And as soon as like all the girls came in, they got they went to this literally like a cupboard. They got changed and came out in the most obscene clothing. Uh, and then the day after, this like this party after. So it, it, it is a real eye-opening experience in Iran. I'm sure lots of people who have been there have had. And it's this incredible thing that when you go to someone's home. Lots of the time, they would. I mean, it was one person got a bottle of vodka from his garden that he had dug up in the garden, and he dug it up and he said, "We drink now," uh, because their concept of drinking is they don't have a beer or wine at the end of work like we do. They open a bottle of vodka, and you finish the bottle of vodka, <laughs> um, which is not conducive to cycling at 6 a.m. the next morning for 160 kilometers. Getting lost and endless climbing. Um, getting lost was an issue, which. Obviously, I didn't have any maps. I had one map of China, actually. Uh, when my parents were out to Istanbul, I realized I needed a map. Uh, but getting lost was an issue. This was once when I was cycling towards Afghanistan, going the wrong direction, uh, because someone told me it was, that was the way I wanted to go. I asked, how do I get to the next town? And he said, just point it in one direction. And uh, it wasn't the way. Um, so getting lost and climbing. Climbing was obviously something that 
I had to get used to. Uh, I don't know how much, I, I didn't have a GPS, I didn't have any, so I don't have any metrics or statistics of how many meters I climbed throughout the whole trip. Um, but I would assume a lot, because you had to cross the Alps. Um, in Iran, uh, there was big mountains, kind of two and a half, three thousand meter passes. Macedonia, there are mountains. China, Tibet, Tibetan Plateau, there are mountains. And I was not fit. I, I kind of, I, I was like this before I left. I was not fit. But by the time I got to the Alps, I got fit. Um, and switched backs like this became, became like a normal, a normal part. And I, I always saw it as a challenge. Every time I saw like a, a mountain road coming up, I, um, I saw it as a challenge. Getting lost was this would happen in China quite a lot. Um, there'd be this perfect line on the map saying, go this way. You'd get, to, you'd get to the road, the bridge would be not finished, so you'd have to walk down the valley, across the valley, across the river, up the other side, and that'll take about three hours out of your day, which was um, frustrating. <laughs> um, this was me looking at maps, again, trying to be pensive in a selfie. Ooh. Okay, This, this is a, just to show you about the climbing, it's another, another very short video. This was in Iran crossing from the, the desert side of Iran. I, I don't know uh, when people traveled there. It's a very desert, arid side on the south side. And then you cross the mountains onto the Caspian Sea side, and it's like Southeast Asia. There's paddy fields, it's incredibly humid, um, and, it's, and it's a completely different environment, something I did not expect. And this is one road I did not expect. This was after the party you had just seen on the previous photo. Half the sweat was because it was 35 degrees. Half the sweat was because of the amount of vodka I drank. Um, and this is just to kind of show you a level of brokenness. Stephens, climb. Mm -hmm. <sighs> 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 Have a. <laughs> <sighs> 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 July for me and the feels about going across the mountains to Caspian Sea via feels about and Kachal so tired eight thirty five AM 32 kilometers done. And it's uphill for a long way. How oh, my hand. Ah! Woo! I use the video camera as my mirror. So that's why I'm checking out my face at the moment. <laughs> As the road it just drops down, and now, oh fuck! <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to show this video to the kindergarten. Um, but but this is the of not having a map, not really knowing with the GPS system. I didn't know where the top was. I couldn't really plan my trip. I didn't know whether there was another hundred meters, whether this was going to be the crest. Normally, you'd get to the top and go, I'm nearly there and then this other monstrous mountain comes out of nowhere and you realize you've got another three hours to go. You have no idea. Um, and it kind of ties in with a lot with uh, the, the washing. You can see how much sweat I had, so normally I'd just splash my face with water and that'd be my shower for the night. Um, just using this image for sleeping. I would normally, this was quite a quiet road, but assuming this would be a busy road, what I would normally do is say this is 6 p.m., I'll stop cycling, 
I would turn off the road, walk for about a kilometer, a kilometer and a half, never more than that, and try and find somewhere quiet to, um, to camp for the night. Um, and then the end. Uh, 11th of October, arrived at Hong Kong. Stupidly, I decided to end on the Peak Tower in Hong Kong. I don't know if anyone's been to Hong Kong, but uh, I could have ended up on the seaside, zero meters altitude, in a nice cafe. No, I decided to end up at the Peak Tower, which is 400 meters, and possibly the steepest climb I did on my whole trip. Uh, I don't know if anyone's been to the Peak Town, Hong Kong, if anyone's driven up that road, I advise you not to cycle up that road because it is terrible. Um, but it was fun, my friends and family, a few people came out to surprise me, my dad, my brother. Um, Zach, this is a man I cycled with through in China. He was cycling around the world. And um, Sophie, my friend, flew out as a surprise they met for three days, they're now married. That's kind of a cool story. Uh, they got married two weeks ago. Um, I don't really know how they got on, because that's 72 hours in Hong Kong, I can't really remember anything. So how they managed to form a relationship in that time, I don't know. Um, and that was it. Kind of uh, at the end, my brother, younger brother, wasn't there, and my parents. Uh, that's my mum and my dad. Now, the most important question is before you get open to Q&A, why? Why did I do this? Um, a few reasons. I did it for breast cancer care, uh, so I wanted to raise as much money as I could. I ended up raising uh, a very healthy sum of just over £22,000 for breast cancer care, and that was through lots of events I did before, lots of events during, and also lots of events after. Um, which I know that a lot of you wearing the ribbons today that, that have been a real pleasant surprise uh, that someone made, and there's also a little collection box at the, at the back if someone would like to donate anything to breast cancer care. Um, that was one reason. Uh, another reason was um, everything was going really well in my life. Uh, for some people, that's a comfort. Um, for some people, that's I'm happy with the way things are going. For me, it was this is scary. I'm too comfortable. Uh, everything was going well in my job. I had a nice house. Everything was going well. Um, and I, it scared me that I was comfortable. So I decided to, I wanted to change things up a little bit. Um, so, true story, I, was, I used to commute to work eight kilometers per day. Uh, my mind was always very clear when I cycled. I liked the way I thought when I cycled. I cycled to work and I said, I'd like to do this for an extended period of time. So for the whole day at work, I Googled, I researched, I, just, I thought about what I wanted to do. I cycled home at the end of the day I told the two girls I was living with at the time, I'm going to cycle to Hong Kong. Um, and they said, what are you even talking about? And I called up my dad and I said, I'm going to cycle to Hong Kong. And he laughed for a whole minute and then he hung up. Um, and what I realized is that the more people you tell if you're going to do something, whether you're going to set up a company, whether you're going to move to Bangkok, whether you're going to do something crazy, whether you're going to ask out a girl you've been, or ask out a boy you've been thinking about for a long time, the more people you tell you're going to do something, it becomes more of a reality, and then you can't really back out of it. So if I, was going to, if I wanted to set up a company, I would start telling my friends and family, I'm going to set up a hotel, I'm going to set up a company. And then you realize a month later, you meet them in the pub, and they say, oh, how's the company going? And it, it puts pressure on you. So before I even bought a bike, before I even said anything, I was telling people I was going to cycle to Hong Kong. And next time I saw them, they would say, so how's it going? Have you planned anything? How's the website going? And it put this pressure on me. Um, so that's why I did it. Uh, it's not a very good answer, <laughs> granted. Um, people always expect something deeper and something more meaningful. Uh, for me, it was just, just for the sense of adventure. Um, that's my mum. <laughs> and that's the love race. Um, finally, what is adventure to me? Um, adventure to me is... Sometimes people get put off by adventure like when, they, when, when, when they see that I've done something or they look at somebody who's gone to the North Pole or climbed Mount Everest and go, that's great, I like to read about it, I like to see the photos, but what can I do that's adventurous? To me, adventure is something that you do that is outside of your normal routine. Um, even before this, I don't know if any of you have heard of uh, a guy called, an adventurer called Alistair Humphreys. Um, he's a British adventurer. He's, he's, He's very popular, he's got a great website, and he coined a term called micro-adventures, which I learned after I'd done a few of these things. And it's 
what adventure is to me is breaking the norm. So assume you get the train or the metro to work every day. Instead of doing that, why not walk to work? That to me would be an adventure. You see a different side of, of your commute, you see something completely different. Um, before I did this in 2010, I used to get the train home to my family on Boxing Day, uh, uh, Christmas Eve, every Christmas Eve to my family. It was an hour train from London to Hildenborough. And one year I decided to walk home. It was 36 miles, it took me 12 hours. It was stupid, I had all my presents in my bag, I was wearing ridiculous shoes, it was snowing. But that was an adventure. It was small, it was bite-sized, and it was doing something manageable. And to me, that's adventure. And it's adventure that, again, like, uh, adventure would be, as soon as I came back from this trip, I was single, and I started to cycle to work, and I would cycle past girls that I would want to ask out for an ice cream or a coffee, and I cycled past them a few times, and I go, why don't I just stop and ask them if they want an ice cream? So I did it, and I got no's, <laughs> I got yeses, and I got get out of my face. Um, but, but those kind of small bite-sized things are adventure to me, and that's what I try and integrate into my life after this trip. Adventure doesn't have to be climbing Mount Kilimanjaro and spending lots of money and spending lots of time. and you know It can be bite-sized chunks. And this is just a nice quote from someone uh, that no one would have heard of. If you have the chance to do something ridiculous, you really ought to do it. Um, and I like that. I like that. Thank you for listening. That's me. Hit me with your questions, mm -hmm. if there are any. Thank you.